Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Louis. Um, I'm very happy to be here to briefly share the experience of uh, forest landscape restoration in Ethiopia. And uh, our emphasis is mainly on looking at um, state-led initiatives with emphasis on their strengths and limitations. Uh, I will be giving you briefly the you know, bit of background. I think you have uh, just got uh, a little bit of information about it. Then assess the status of uh, forest landscape restoration initiatives, as I said, with uh, focusing on the strengths and limitations so that we could probably have a home tech message with regard to you know what needs to be addressed to improve their effectiveness and efficiency. I just wanted to show you because you know uh, probably we are coming from Africa, from Eastern Ethiopia, I mean Eastern Africa region, so that you could locate where Ethiopia is. But I wanted to show you how diverse agroecologically the country is. And uh, it is the most mountainous country in Africa. So as you move on into, you know, looking at the opportunities and challenges, you would really see the diversity in terms of, you know, agroecology as well as socioeconomic status of the country. Uh, most of the natural forests are in the south and southwest. Much of uh, the participatory forest management that we are talking about would be on this side. But the central highlands in northern Ethiopia is uh, where we have most of the rural population where agriculture has been dominating and land has been degraded for centuries. And in this area, we talk about area exclosures and um, so that you could actually locate yourself. Uh, I thought this picture would really give, you know, so much meaning in terms of what is going on. And as you could see, uh, it's not only rural population pressure, but you have a huge livestock population also. It's, um, you know, the largest livestock population in Africa is found in Ethiopia. And it's also an indication where, you know, you don't have really vegetation, literally. Most of the plantations are around the homesteads and it actually implies also the issue of tenure. And as you could see, you know, steep slopes are also cultivated, a very good indication that, um, you know, the country doesn't still have a very clear national land use plan and also definition of what forest is and what forest land is. Now to just give you a very you know, general context, as I said earlier, uh, Ethiopia is a mountainous country where the need for forest, land, forest and landscape restoration is critical. Uh, still, it is a very rural society. Over 80% of almost 100 million depend on agriculture. And highlands have been cultivated for ages and as a result, they are severely degraded. We estimate more than three quarters of the islands are uh, highly degraded. Agricultural expansion, be it commercial and smallholder, and also fuel wood extraction are the major drivers of deforestation and uh, forest degradation, uh, respectively. But also, you know, being in, in the tropics, you know, the climate change and the effects of climate variability has increased from the 1970s to the current. Now we really have, you know, one in 10 years of drought now has increased into more than three uh, years of drought in 10 years. In some cases, you might even have one drought in every, you know, two, three years. As a result, the country has been, you know, engaged in soil and water conservation efforts and, you know, landscape rehabilitation way, way, way before, you know, you know, the global world was paying attention to. Now, as an ancient country and dependent on agriculture, you know, land degradation was there, you know, for centuries. So an attempt was made in the 1890s to introduce eucalyptus from Australia, which you have seen earlier. Up until 1970s, what you see was, you know, the country is a feudalist system and forests were designated in the, in the land use system as westlanders. So if you have a westland, then you pay more taxes so that was how you know, the active conversion of forests into agriculture was promoted through policy. In 1975, Peter highlighted the, you know, the national, uh, nationalization of lands and forests. You know, it was kind of a revolution. Till then, you know, all lands and forests belonged to the government. And again, since 1995, we also follow 
um, a decentralized uh, federal system, which, as you could imagine, has a huge implication on forest governance. And since 2007, now we have a new law, and the, for the forest forest policy, where the rights of communities to manage forests is recognized, but the details were not there. And in 2011, I think the country made you know, this radical shift to uh, become a carbon neutral country by 2030. And then forestry was identified as one of the pillars. I think since then, now the policymakers are really paying attention to you know, landscape rehabilitation at landscape. In 2013, now we have uh, a separate ministry to, to facilitate these initiatives. <coughs> now in the, the current five-year development plan, we have really major, major goals to increase the contribution of forest to the national economy, as well as to increase the forest cover. Now, in doing so, farmers have their own initiatives of growing trees here and there, but there are two major initiatives that I would like to focus on. One is the participatory forest management that Peter was talking about, and the other one is area exclosure that uh, Dr. Muru will be talking about uh, shortly. And these are actually state-led initiatives that we thought could highlight you know, the experiences and challenges of you know, Ethiopia in rehabilitating you know, forest landscape. Um, you know, areas. And as you could imagine, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, the country has committed in you know, one of the largest commitments in Bone Challenge, 15 million. And the assumption behind was, you know, that the, the government will mobilize millions of households to do the rehabilitation work, and the international community will be backstopping it. So this 15 million hectare is generally assumed by government, I mean, authorities as possible to be achieved through mobilization of you know, millions of households. Over the last probably you know, a couple of years, the government is mobilizing rural households to actually contribute up to 30 to 40 Mondays of free labor for landscape rehabilitation <coughs> annually. Tree planting is going on, but as we have noted, uh, these tree planting initiatives are very often done on communal lands. And our assessment shows that you know, the results were not impressive. But on the other hand, as you could see, these are also farmers' own initiative of tree planting with no government support at all, but very, very effective and also very successful, as I will come back again. As I told you, there is an ambitious plan of the government on the next five years, and much of this is supposed to be achieved through you know, uh, landscape restoration efforts by engaging communities and all other actors. Now, our study focused at actually looking at what experiences do we have, what can we learn, and what can uh, we suggest to improve effectiveness and efficiency. And uh, we wanted also to identify improvement measures to improve you know, the conservation as well as livelihood <coughs> outcomes of these uh, restoration objectives that uh, Dr. Muru will be talking about sh shortly. As I said, by looking at you know, the national experience on participatory forest management, uh, which Peter was uh, actually talking about based on uh, a case study, from our national review, uh, you know, we used certain indicators which we thought are necessary to ensure that participatory forest management contributes to conservation as well as livelihood objectives. Based on a number of criteria, uh, we have assessed you know, experiences all over the country, and we concluded that PFM was energy driven, and the, the, the involvement of the government was low. Uh, still, you know, even if it has started in the mid-1990s, the government hasn't actually fully owned the process, even if it is in the policy document, that it would be the major vehicle to put much of the natural forest under, under improved, you know, uh, participatory forest management. Assessment shows that there is a better forest outcome, uh, but um, we are worried that there are leakages here and there that hasn't been reported because NGOs tend to report on the on forest patches that they have been actually involved in. Both the experts and community members believe that the conservation gains are meaningful and appreciated but economic gains are much, much below their expectations. 
So we concluded that in you know, forests under PFM, their productivity levels is low, the management is very restricted. As a, res as a result, economic benefits that communities could gain uh, remain very low. And one of the reasons that we thought uh, as a very you know, serious limitation was suboptimal community participation. While the communities are engaged, involved, but their voices in terms of you know, what to generate from foresters was dictated by the forestry experts as the initial objective was reducing deforestation, not increasing income of uh, farmer households. On the other hand, be it at the experts level, but also at the community level, there is an institutional as well as you know, human resource uh, capacity limitation to negotiate with the government, to develop a meaningful plan, and to optimize between conservation and development goals. We also noted that there has generally been a weak follow-up and takeover of PFM projects by the government and overall in the project management cycle of participatory forest management. As a result, we are worried that the sustainability of participatory forest management project, I mean forests under PFM, is questioned due to economic incentives. The whole issue of tenure that uh, Peter uh, talked about is also there. Now this is an example. Now let me go to the area exclosures. I think that the term is about you know, setting aside a designated degraded uh, landscape to allow it to rehabilitate and you know, to come back to you know, more a productive stage in terms of you know, uh, mainly you know, for forestry objective. So there is no cutting of trees, cultivation, grazing, etc. So there is also a kind of a management type and bylaw that should be agreed upon. And this is considered generally by the government as a successful experience. And this is the one that's going to be used to achieve the 15 million hectare target set by the government. But again, our knowledge on the process, establishment and management, as well as the outcome of area exclosures was limited. And we were engaged in actually identifying effective practices, limitations and challenges to sustainability. So a team of experts uh, sat down nationally, identified procedures, criteria and indicators, and evaluated area exclosure experiences mainly in northern Ethiopia. So the study concluded that area exclosure, unlike PFM, was mainly government driven. The involvement of NGOs was limited. Uh, and again, good ecological outcomes, but very poor productivity and economic gains, suboptimal community participation, much of the cost is still borne by the communities and the incentive mechanisms for communities remain limited. And underdeveloped institutional capacity is still there. So again, sustainability is questioned by tenure and security and weak incentives. So these are you know, examples where you know, community mobilization in terms of soil and water conservation, you could really imagine you know, the number of mandates put behind to restore these lands. So these are the changes you could see. Uh, other challenges have to do with population <coughs> pressure, landlessness, ambitious targets for agriculture as well as forestry, you know, but very limited capacity at the landscape level as well as at the institutional level to make the trade-offs between development and conservation objectives, neglecting farmers' own initiatives in landscape rehabilitation, we saw it as a challenge. And l there is little experience in actually little evidence to show that international experience and knowledge is embedded into the planning of these, uh, these initiatives. The shared strength is high-level commitment, community mobilization, investment by the community is significant, uh, encouraging uh, conservation outcomes, boundaries are socially fenced, and government continues to assist in both cases, even though the engagement of the government in both varies. The limitations are same I, I talked about again we need to make sure that you know community involvement is maximized so that they could really be given the opportunity to negotiate objectives and management plans uh, tenure security should be ensured productivity must be increased as a conclusion uh, Ethiopia is engaged in major you know filler activities 
these two area exclusion and participatory forest management are the two that the government is counting on to achieve the 22 million uh, hectare of forest landscape rehabilitation by 2025. But sustainability is questioned because of you know poverty and landlessness, but also suboptimal participation of communities, mainly focus on conservation, less on economic gains, and tenure insecurity and little and unclear you know uh, forms of net benefit sharing mechanisms as well as in you know, weak institutional as well as human resource capacity to plan, monitor and evaluate. So addressing these challenges we hope will make you know flare initiatives in Ethiopia much more you know uh, uh, rewarding to communities and also much more sustainable locally. And by so doing, we hope that you know, the country could also contribute to the global climate change mitigation efforts. I thank you.